Hi, this video is an introduction to complex algebra by way of solving AC circuits. It assumes some trig, but calculus is left to part two, which gets a bit more involved in the Euler equation and imaginary numbers. Oh, and apologies for misquoting Larson in his wonderful cartoon. Sine waves are the way many of us first meet complex algebra in trying to solve simple AC circuits. This clip develops by showing how phasor diagrams provide a simpler, graphical alternative to working directly with waveforms or trigonometry, and then introduces complex algebra as an algebraic computer-friendly technique based on the geometry of phasor diagrams that allows us to treat sine waves much the same as DC. So why worry about sine waves anyway? Well, useful electrical systems are often driven by them, and the generation of electricity, as pointed out by Nikola Tesla, is most easily done in the form of alternating current. Spinning an electric coil in a magnetic field, or equivalently, spinning a magnet inside a coil, produces electricity in the form of sine waves. As winding three individual coils increases the generator output with a minimum of extra wiring, most of us get our electrical power from one or all of the three phases of a generator wound somewhat like this. But there are many different types of engineering system and many different types of signal. For example, in addition to power systems, sine waves are particularly important in communications and electronics. But they also enable powerful means of analysing and designing systems, whatever signals are involved. The frequency response of systems, such as audio speakers or communication links, say, is a picture of their output to sine waves across the range of frequencies they can respond to, and it's a useful measure of their performance. But Fourier tells us this sine wave response can also be used in modelling the behaviour of a system, like this circuit, to any form of input. An adequate model can be simulated on a computer, and this then opens up the use of powerful tools for the understanding, control and construction of all sorts of systems. In summary, sine waves are important, and this clip hopes to show that they can be best handled using complex algebra. And complex algebra itself underpins not only sine wave analysis, but other important topics such as our understanding of how ordinary numbers work, and indeed our understanding, such as it is, of how nature itself works in quantum mechanics. This section looks at how components of AC circuits respond to sine waves and the operations needed to analyse them. Such analysis is helped by the fact that well-behaved systems like this circuit, driven by a constant amplitude sine wave supply, will settle down to a steady state where the signals, here all the voltages and currents, are constant amplitude sine waves of the same frequency as the driving signal. But they will have different sizes and phase shifts. So, whereas in direct current circuits we can represent each voltage, current or impedance by a single number, like 10 volts, 3 amps or 4 ohms, now to work with AC circuits we need at least two values, the amplitude and the phase shift. But the good news is we needn't worry too much about representing the sine wave frequency because it's common throughout. Along with the resistance, AC circuits include the additional two-terminal passive components of capacitance and inductance. Resistance in conductors comes from the friction and resulting heat generated as the flow of electric charge barges its way through the atomic structure of the material, forced through by the applied voltage. Now the current, or flow of charge in a pure resistor with no internal energy store, has to be directly related to the voltage forcing the flow. Ohm's law gives the resistance in ohms as simply the ratio of the voltage dropped across the component and the current passing through it. So, if the applied voltage is a sine wave, then the resistor current is also a sine wave of the same phase. A capacitor won't pass a current flowing continuously in one direction, as the insulating dielectric blocks the flow. But when an external source tries to push a current, charges will build up on the plates, and as they build up, these positive charges, or lack of electrons on one side, and negative charges, or electrons on the other, 
set up a voltage which opposes the inward flow in proportion to the number of charges that have accumulated. The capacitance C of the device, measured in farads, is the ratio of charges to voltage. This build-up of charge stores energy in the electrostatic field within the dielectric, which can be released, pushing the charges away, if the applied pressure is reduced, which is what happens if the source is sinusoidal. The capacitor is therefore a store of electrostatic energy. In this circuit with the resistor and the capacitor, the sine wave supply voltage Vs will increase from zero, pushing a current I around the circuit and forcing charges onto the conducting plates, building up the capacitor voltage Vc. Until it builds up sufficiently to match the applied voltage, which brings the flow of current to a stop, with no volt drop across the resistor. At this point of maximum voltage Vc, there is maximum energy stored in the electrostatic field between the positive and negative charges that have been forced together. As the applied sinusoidal voltage Vs reduces, then the charge stored will rebound like a coiled spring, pushing charges back out in the anticlockwise direction towards the source, and discharging the capacitor voltage Vc, until it reaches zero, when all the charges are flown and the current is at its reverse maximum, and just starting to build up charges on the opposite side of the capacitor until these have slowed the current to a halt at the point where the capacitor voltage is at its negative maximum. Finally, the charges rebound once more, pushing current clockwise, until the capacitor is discharged again, completing the cycle. So with an alternating voltage source, these waveforms show that the maximum voltage across a pure capacitor is when the current is zero, so that the current sine wave leads the voltage sine wave by one quarter of a wavelength, or 90 degrees. The impedance, or capacitive reactance Xc, is found by dividing the sinusoidal voltage Vc across the component by the sinusoidal current I passing through it, which has a different phase. The magnitude of this reactance is less with greater capacitance because more charges are required to build up a voltage. It's also less with increasing source frequency omega because at shorter wavelengths there is less time for charges to build up, both of which mean less opposition or impedance to current flow. And its phase is this 90 degree shift between the capacitor voltage and current. This result is derived a bit more formally for reference in part 2. This is a picture of the waveforms in all the components. The operations needed to analyse circuits like this are the same as for DC, and include division and multiplication in the relationship between voltage, current and impedance, while addition and subtraction is also needed, for example here, to add the voltages across the resistor and capacitor to equate them to the supply voltage. However, instead of constant DC levels, we now have to work with sine waves of different magnitudes and phases. The other simple passive component is inductance. An electric current in the wire generates a magnetic field, lambda here, which can be concentrated by winding a coil. The inductance, L, measured in Henry's of a particular coil, is defined as the ratio of magnetic flux to the current producing it. The magnetic field has energy. It can move things. And this energy has to be built up from, or sent back to, the electrical circuit that produces it. A steady current can flow through an inductor without opposition, as no energy is being transferred. But if the current changes, then the magnetic field and its energy must change with it, and in doing so will either build up or decay, cutting through the turns of the coil. This induces a coil voltage VL by Faraday's law that will oppose the change in current, so transferring the change in magnetic field energy to the electrical circuit. And the faster the current changes, the faster energy is being transferred and the greater the induced voltage. So the inductor acts as a store of electromagnetic energy that uses that energy to oppose any change in the current flowing through it. This slide shows the waveforms of the coil when the current flowing is sinusoidal. In this case, the inductor voltage is maximum at the points where the current is changing most rapidly that is, when the current is passing through zero, and zero when the current is not changing, that is, when the current is at a maximum or minimum. The ratio of coil voltage to current is its impedance, or inductive reactance, XL, 
whose magnitude depends directly on inductance L because a larger field stores more energy, and also on frequency omega because it's harder to push that energy around faster. And with a sinusoidal current, the inductive voltage will also be sinusoidal, but leading the current here as shown by a phase of 90 degrees. And this result is again derived more formally for reference in part 2. Just like the previous circuit with a resistor and capacitor, this circuit with an inductor and resistor requires the addition of sine waves of different size and phase for its analysis, but this time with the current lagging the supply voltage. OK, so the problem is to work with sinusoidal quantities of different magnitudes and phase shifts. And there are a few different ways that we can go about doing this. Say that we need to add together the blue and black sine waves amplitudes V1 and V2 with phase shifts theta1 and theta2 to find the sum Vt. We could do it by adding up the two graphs point by point along the time axis like so, although that could get a bit tedious. A better analytical approach is to use trig to add together the two components. If locked in with a book of trig tables, the result for the two component bits of the answer can be found and combined using Pythagoras and the tan formula to give this result for the total voltage Vt, magnitude and phase shift theta t. However, this is also a bit heavy going and remembering this result, we can look for an easier way still. Geometry provides this easier route, as it turns out, or rather around, that a rotating vector or phasor can be used to represent a sine or cosine wave. As a phasor rotates, its projection, as shown here onto the axis above, this maps out a sine wave. The length of the phasor determines the magnitude or peak value of the wave, and its angle, the phase of the wave. As there is a direct correspondence between the phasor and the waveform, the phasor can be used to represent the waveform and to perform calculations. Moreover, since all the sine waves being dealt with are at the same frequency, all the phasors representing them will be spinning around at the same rate, and so this common rotation can be ignored in the calculations, which saves having to put the paper on a turntable. So instead of trig or wiggly sine waves, we can work with straight line phasors. But first, let's check it's OK for our calculations. Going back to the problem of adding two sine waves together, if both are now represented as phasors with the appropriate phase angle difference, it turns out that vector addition of the two phasors gives a vector representing the sum of the two sine waves. And we can confirm this by comparing the result of the previous trig calculations with that of adding the two phasors, which can be done like normal vector addition by completing the parallelogram or equivalently by adding the horizontal and vertical components of each vector. The sum in the horizontal direction is v1 cos theta1 plus v2 cos theta2 as shown here, which must be equal to the horizontal component of the total vt cos theta t. Similarly, the sum of the two vertical components v1 sine theta1 and v2 sine theta2 must add up to the vertical component of the sum vt sine theta t which confirms the previous trig result, illustrating that the simple geometry of vectors can replace trig to perform calculations like this on sine waves. Now applying phases to circuit components, starting with a resistor, where voltage and current are in phase but with different magnitudes, they can be drawn like this. For a capacitor, the current leads the voltage by 90 degrees, so the picture is like this. And for the inductor, the current lags the voltage by 90 degrees. We can now use these phasor diagrams to analyse single frequency AC circuits like this one. Firstly, however, though every voltage and current in the circuit shares the same frequency, so we can ignore the fact that our phases are whizzing around, we do need frequency to find the impedances of reactive components, as these do depend directly on it. So for the capacitor here, we can use the previous formula for capacitive reactants being 1 over omega c, where omega, the frequency in rads per second, is 2 pi times the frequency f in hertz, to get a value of 7.96 kilohms. 
Now in this series circuit, the current is common to all the components, and so we can use this as a reference direction. And the voltage across a resistor is in phase with the current passing through it, and so we can draw a vector representing the VR aligned with our reference current. The voltage across the capacitor, however, lags the current by 90 degrees, so we can draw a vector representing VC down in that direction. The total circuit voltage VT is the vector sum of the voltage across the resistor and capacitor. So VT is the hypotenuse of the triangle making the phase angle theta with our reference current direction. Also, since the current is common throughout, we can divide each vector by it, so that VR divided by I is the resistance R, VC divided by I is the capacitive reactance XC, and VT divided by I is the total impedance Z of the capacitor and resistor together. This gives us the impedance triangle shown, which is a similar triangle to that in the voltage phase of diagram, and on which we can use Pythagoras to find the values of Z from XC and R as 14.4 kilo ohms, and then the value of current as the applied voltage VT divided by that total impedance Z as 69.5 microamps, as a phase angle theta equals 33.5 degrees relative to the reference current. Having solved for the current, we can then go back and use Ohm's law to find the voltages across the capacitor and resistor, completing the analysis. OK then, working with phasers using geometry and trig is a lot easier than trying to cope with either sine waves or trig alone. So how can complex algebra make it even easier? Well, geometry is fine for simple circuits and systems, but things can get a bit tangled in complex problems where a bit of machine help would also be useful. Complex algebra enables us to capture the geometry of a phaser by wrapping up its two quantities of magnitude and phase angle into one variable that can be simply processed on paper or by computer. The trick to complex algebra is to realize that multiplying a vector by minus one is equivalent to reversing its direction without changing its magnitude. And this is equivalent to a change in phase angle of 180 degrees. If we multiply by minus 1 twice, we get back to 1 times v, which is where we started, a full 360 degree turn. Now, minus 1 for 180 degrees, or left, and plus for right is fine, but it's restricted to the real axis whereas to represent phases we need to break out of the real axis and include the up and down directions as well as left and right to give a complete two-dimensional picture. Here's the thing. If multiplying by minus 1 gives us 180 degrees, let's pretend we have some operator which gives us a 90 degree change in phase. Call it J, so that J times V points up. Then for consistency, multiplying by J twice will give us 180 degrees again, this means that j times j must equal minus 1, lining up the red boxes here, and if j squared is minus 1, then j must be equal to the square root of minus 1. Ah. Without worrying about the existence of root minus 1 for a moment, let's press on. Multiplying by j yet again will swing the angle to 270 degrees and point our phaser down. And now we have j times j times j, or replacing j squared by minus 1, gives simply minus j, and this checks out as equivalent to multiplying our original j direction by minus 1. Finally, multiplying by j yet again brings us back to the start point, with j times j times j times j, or minus 1 times minus 1, or plus 1, for the full 360 degrees. Now we can say that multiplying any phasor by j is equivalent to swinging it around anticlockwise by 90 degrees in the angle bracket without changing its magnitude v, shown here in the vertical line brackets, through 180 to 270 and all the way around to 360. As the phasor is spinning around anticlockwise, every multiplication by j advances the waveform, pushing it towards the left. And the point is that as positive values point rightwards and negative values point left, so j values point up and minus j values point down, and we have a means of describing phases pointing in any direction. Incidentally, this imaginary operator can be called either i or j. Imaginary because it doesn't really exist, perhaps. <laughs> 
Electrical engineers tend to use J and reserve the letter I for current, while mathematicians tend to call it I, maybe to align it with the IJK unit vectors they use for three dimensions. We can now simply call the vertical axis the J or imaginary or IM direction, and the term like 4J simply means the vector four units long pointing vertically upwards. And now we have this imaginary axis, we can represent any vector as a combination of RE real and IM imaginary components, with J indicating the imaginary direction. So V equals A plus JB specifies a vector defined by the length A along the real axis and length B along the vertical. Admittedly, there's still the slight snag that square root of minus 1 doesn't exist, uh, or well it didn't, but now it's been invented it turns out to be amazingly useful. This is the so-called Cartesian form after René Descartes, the French philosopher and mathematician of I think therefore I am fame. It's the most convenient form for addition and subtraction operations, as to add say two complex numbers you simply have to add the real bits and the imaginary bits separately to get the real and the imaginary bits of the result. However, multiplication and division is trickier in Cartesian form and it's convenient to swap into the polar form which specifies the vector by its magnitude or length r, and the angle theta it makes the horizontal reference direction. It's easy to convert from one form to the other, and many calculators say have built-in functions to do this. The length is simply found by Pythagoras, and the tangent gives a phase angle. Converting back the other way, there is a simple sine and cosine relationship to find the Cartesian components from the polar ones. For the addition of two variables v1 and v2 in Cartesian form, we add the real and imaginary bits separately, or for subtraction, subtract the real and imaginary bits separately. So for example, to add v1 and v2, here we add the 2.5 real bit of v1 to the 1.5 real bit of v2 to get 4 as the real bit of the total vt. And then the imaginary part of vt is 3 from v1 added to minus 1 from v2 to give 2. So Vt is simply equal to 4 plus J2. Similarly, subtracting the two vectors gives the subtraction of the real bits as 2.5 minus 1.5 or 1, and the imaginary bits as 3 minus minus 1 or plus 4. This is another quick example of adding together circuit variables, in this case the currents I1 and I2, here in polar form. I1 has a magnitude of 5 amps and a leading phase angle of 53.1 degrees, while I2 is 13 amps but has a lagging phase angle of minus 67.4 degrees. The first thing to do is to convert both into Cartesian form using the cosine and sine formulae to get 3 plus J4 and 5 minus J12 respectively. Adding the real and imaginary parts then gives the total of 8 minus J8 which can then, if be necessary, be converted back into polar form using the Pythagoras and Tan formulae, although it's quicker with a calculator. Polar form is based on the famous Euler equation, as close to magic as most anything I know of, and which is a topic for part two. The gist for us here is that it defines e to the j theta, an exponential raised to an imaginary power theta, as simply the angle theta in radians as the real axis distance of 1 times cos theta and the imaginary distance of 1 times sine theta add up to the point at the end of a vector of unit length and phase angle theta. So we can write the polar form of any phase row of magnitude r and phase angle theta more formally as r times e to the j theta, where r is an ordinary real variable describing the length of the vector, but theta, mathematically e to the j theta, is a power and obeys the rules of powers in calculations. For example, a voltage of 2 volts at a leading phase angle of 60 degrees, or pi by 3 radians, is 2 to the power of j times pi by 3 volts. Owing to this definition of phase angles as powers, the operations of multiplication, division and raising values to some power are most easily done in the polar form.
for example, given V1 and V2, to multiply them, simply multiply the real R1 and R2 bits in the usual way to find the total magnitude, but add the angles theta1 and theta2 to find the total phase. Similarly, for division, divide the magnitudes, but subtract the phase angles. To square a value, square the magnitude and double the phase. And finally, to find a reciprocal, invert the magnitude, but change the sign of the angle. An example of division is to find the current flowing through some impedance of 12 ohms of the phase angle of 30 degrees. Where we can simply divide the applied voltage magnitude of 240 volts by 12 to find the current is 12 amps, and subtract the 30 degrees from zero to find the lagging phase angle of minus 30 degrees. Coming back to the original components, but now with added complex algebra, a resistor has resistance of magnitude r ohms, but zero phase shift. Whereas a capacitor has a reactance of magnitude 1 over omega times c and a phase shift of minus 90 degrees, which is in the minus j direction. Notice, however, that the reactance can be written wrapped up as a single imaginary quantity, minus j times 1 over omega c. For example, a 10 microfarad capacitor in a circuit frequency of 1000 rads per second will have a reactance of minus j 100 ohms. That is 100 ohms magnitude and minus 90 degrees phase. And an inductor has a reactance of magnitude omega times L and a phase shift of plus 90 degrees, or simply J omega L Henry's. For example, a 100 millihenry inductor in a circuit frequency of 100 rads per second will have a reactance of J 10 ohms. That is 10 ohms magnitude and plus 90 degrees phase. That would increase to a reactance of 100 ohms at a frequency of 1000 rads per second at the same phase shift. We can now revisit our previous example using complex algebra. Notice here that our phase angle reference is provided by the input voltage signal at zero degrees. Just as for DC circuits, we can now add up all the components to find the total circuit impedance Z, with complex algebra taking care of the phase angles, giving the total as the real resistance R plus the imaginary impedance minus J times XC. As capacitive reactance lags by 90 degrees, so Z equals 12K from the resistor minus J 7.96 kilohms as the capacitive reactance calculated previously as 1 over 2 pi times F times C. Since we have to do some multiplications and divisions, we need to move Z into the polar form using the Pythagoras and Tan relationships to give 14.4 kilohms in the direction of minus 33.6 degrees. Having got the impedance, the circuit current is now just V over Z, giving 69.4 microamps at an angle of plus 33.6 degrees. The resistor voltage is I times R, or 0.83 volts at 33.6 degrees leading, and the voltage across the capacitor is I times XC, or 0.53 volts at minus 56.4 degrees, completing the solution. Notice how the complex algebra cleanly keeps track of both gain and phase shift throughout the calculation, showing that the capacitor voltage lags the input voltage by 56 degrees, while the resistor voltage leads it by 33 degrees. The takeaway here is hopefully that complex algebra enables us to encapsulate both gain and phase information for the voltages, currents and impedances in an AC circuit, so that analysis can be done using the same techniques as for solving DC circuits but with algebra automatically keeping track of phase relationships as well as magnitudes, without the need for tricky geometry or trigonometry. And that just about wraps up this part. Although not perhaps a major worry for solving circuits, some aspects of complex algebra are still a bit of a puzzle though, in both the magic Euler equation and in what imaginary numbers are anyway. Part two looks at those issues in a bit more detail.